welcome to Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to scientists, entrepreneurs, and deep tech starters, and to all those who support uh, this amazing movement of uh, making our world a better place. So today I have um, the, the, the luck to, to have a co as a co-host Harold Knoll, serial tech entrepreneur. He's also a business angel and now entrepreneur again with the, the startup Dayu, uh, a startup in the longevity field. And we have today a fantastic guest, um, Sebastian uh, Brunmeyer, biologist by training, expert in, the, in geroscience. He's also a serial biotech entrepreneur and now a VC investor in the longevity aging field. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for being our guest today. How are you today? Great. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Hello, Hello how are you? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Sebastian, maybe um, we can start uh, this interview by, you know, by asking you uh, to, to explain us your journey, you know, from um, from science to to being an entrepreneur and and then now a, a VC investor. But even maybe you can we can talk about how uh, the driving force of studying science uh, come into your mind when you were when you were a child. Is it, was it something that? Uh, uh, was always there or was it something that you discovered at high school, you know, by, by randomly because you, you like a, you like a course or? Yeah, sure. So um, where to begin? Uh, you know, I've been in the longevity biotech or long bio field for about 10 years as a scientist, uh, company founder and venture investor. Um, I first learned about it, the field uh, through Aubrey de Grey. Uh, he gave a presentation the TED conference, and I read his book, Ending Aging, which was the first sort of engineering approach to how to address the molecular damage that causes aging in a sequence, in a very um, clear, clear cut way. Um, and, you know, I thought I want to be a medical doctor, but then I realized that most of the drugs uh, sort of don't work very well, they have toxicity, and they deal with the late stage pathology, sort of um, palliating the symptoms of disease rather than treating the root cause of disease, generally speaking. Um, and in the United States, being a doctor is not such a good situation these days. You have to fight with the insurance companies and the government and so on. So, um, and I was always more interested in science anyway. So um, I pursued research as an undergrad in the biology of aging, uh, worked at a couple of different institute, institutes like the Buck Institute, um, the Gulbenkian Institute. I did a Fulbright Fellowship there on telomere biology. Um, I worked for a family office in London investing in biotech. I joined Apollo Health Ventures, which is today the largest aging focus venture fund with over 200 million under management. It's also a company builder based in Germany. Um, and there we built uh, several different longevity biotech companies. Um, and I built a company for them called Samsara Therapeutics, which is about autophagy enhancement. So when you do fasting or exercise, uh, the main reason, one of the main reasons why it's beneficial and extends lifespan in animals, at least, is because it turns on this molecular process called autophagy, where the cell breaks down its internal components and then rebuilds them. Uh, so the cell can break down everything, all of its organelles, like my mitochondria, this is called mitophagy. Uh, and it has been shown by many groups over decades that autophagy enhancement is beneficial. There was even a Nobel Prize uh, awarded for autophagy. And yet, at the time, no one had set up an effort to systematically search for small molecule enhancers of autophagy. Mm -hmm. But we knew that one of the best performing, the gold standard geroprotective small molecule uh, drugs, rapamycin, uh, works in large part by autophagy enhancement, but also inhibits translation, has anti-inflammatory properties, many other properties, but, but autophagy is very important. So we knew that. We knew it was druggable. We knew that it extended healthy lifespan across species because of the rabomycin example. And yet no one had done a systematic screening platform for it. So, so I set that up, um, founded this company, Samsara in Oxford, UK. Now it's expanded to I think about 20 full-time people, uh, it's the largest autophagy-focused drug discovery company. It's one of the flagship companies in the Apollo portfolio. And we're putting our first drug in the clinic within the next year or so. And we have several different mechanism of action autophagy enhancers as well. Um, and that's got a rock star team behind it. So uh, while I was doing that, I was in the PhD program at Oxford. 
uh, and uh, doing biochemistry of aging. And that was quite cool. Um, I loved being in Oxford, uh, but I dropped out because I had an opportunity to launch a new company called Cambrian Biopharma to co-found it. Sorry to yeah. interrupt you. So just to sure. well understand uh, your path, you, you build this biotech startup Samsara before entering to the PhD, right? Yeah, I started wow. it um, immediately, shortly before, about a year before starting the PhD. And then I continued to run it during the PhD. Um, and then I recruited in a senior pharma management team who has crazy. carried it forward. Yeah, your, your path is crazy because, you know, <laughs> Usually people wait to enter into the PhD program, you know, find something or during the postdoc and then make the transfer into a startup. But you did everything before everything, everything that in the normal field, you know, so that is fantastic. So you're such an sparing. And you you also started, you know, as a, to, to know the, the the investment when you when you have a fit into this family office. And when we was in, in, in this family office, what what your role was also to invest in startup for the family office or was it something like investing in the stock market or? Yeah, yeah, it was private equity and venture capital. Um, and that's where I, you know, first started to understand venture capital law and, and these deal terms. Uh, I also forgot to mention, I um, before I started Apollo, I did a master's degree in molecular neuroscience on brain aging and biotech business management, how to run biotech companies purportedly, they teach you. And that was in the University of Amsterdam. So I did have a little bit of expertise there, but I was always in a rush and always sort of multitasking because, you know, we are decaying rapidly. And, you know, I've come to realize that there are no adults in the room as far as uh, this problem goes. Like there's no group that is like, well, now there is, but at, when I started, there was no group of people who was like, how are we going to, uh, slow the aging process, you know, sophisticated pharma people or government officials or people who have authority, access to capital. There was nobody out there who was really masterminding any kind of, you know, architecture for addressing the problem of aging. There were no adults in the room. And to this day, even in big pharma, there are very few groups who are taking like a broad view and saying, here are the technologies that we think are going to be the future of pharma. Big pharma itself is very reactive. They kind of wait for academics or for biotech companies to prove in the clinic that a mechanism of action works, like checkpoint inhibitors in immune oncology, for example, and then they buy these companies relatively late in the process at a huge premium. Mm -hmm. So it's really this sort of organic um, bottom-up process of innovation bubbling up, but it's a very inefficient process presently. I mean, it's getting better by the year, more capital, more talent, more government support, more university sophistication and biotech startups and venture. But really, it's it's one of the most important things that we do as a society is biomedical innovation. And it's just kind of being left to like this sort of random process. And, and you know, so to give you one example, the, the level of priority that we as a society ascribe to biomedical innovation, NIH budget is about 40 billion a year. Right. The NIH is the largest funder of biomedical research in the world um, and 40 billion a year. Um, <laughs> the United States spends about 60 billion a year on beer consumption alone, the <laughs> drinking of beer. Right. So it kind of shows you our priorities a little crazy. The Pentagon budget for the military is about one trillion a year. Yeah. Um, the intelligence community budget, we don't know exactly how much it is, but it's in the hundreds of billions per year. So, you know, and we're not being killed by, you know, foreign governments or terrorists or whatever. We're being killed by age-related diseases, primar primarily atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease and stroke, uh, but also cancer and diabetes is a growing one, uh, metabolic syndrome, dementia, et cetera. So like <laughs> our priorities, our priorities are very messed up. Um, and so, you know, I kind of realized that this is an undervalued area um, and that's where I wanted to focus my efforts. So just to finish the story, uh, the career story. So um, paused the PhD at Oxford, um, co-founded a company called Cambrian Biopharma, which is a disco model company. So it's a distributed drug discovery company where we can pull together a lot of different assets targeting the biology of aging under one larger umbrella. There are a lot of advantages to doing that. Um, and that company has raised significant capital around 200 million in the last four years. And we have sophisticated, you know, biotech execs we brought on board 
Uh, and today it is one of the largest aging focused biotech companies. Um, and then after that, I uh, co-founded uh, Healthspan Capital, or a venture fund investing in long bio and regenerative medicine. Last year, our first full operating year, we were the most active investor in the longevity space. We did 15 deals. Um, and I've also recently co-founded a company uh, called Immune Age Bio, and we are doing immune system rejuvenation. So we're targeting the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. So in your bone marrow, you have these very precious cells, HSCs, hematopoietic stem cells. They give rise to the whole immune system as well as the red blood cells. And uh, one of the major drivers of aging is immune senescence, the failure of the function of the immune system to surveil for tumors. You know, the main reason why we all don't have cancer right now at this very moment is because our immune system is constantly surveilling for nascent tumors and nipping them in the bud, eliminating them. Um, but the immune system also does a lot of other stuff. It's very important in inflammation, neuroinflammation, driving dementia, general inflammation, causing metabolic syndrome, um, cardiovascular disease, you know, immune cells clear out your vasculature. Uh, and it has the HSCs themselves, the stem cells, have this incredible regenerative capacity, along with mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs. The HSCs, they actually leave your bone marrow at night when you're asleep. And they circulate throughout the body and they home to sites of injury and damage and inflammation and actually repair them. And so with immune age, um, you know, I've been in the field for 10 years and I never heard of any group that was doing systematic drug discovery for immune system rejuvenation. Very similar sort of pattern as for samsara. It was so obvious. There's so much evidence in the literature. We even call uh, one of the major drivers of aging coined by Claudia Franceschi, inflammation aging. Because with aging, we get this general inflammatory tone. We have this myeloid lymphoid skewing. We have more generalized myeloid cells and innate immunity. Uh, and that inflammation kind of causes the immune system to turn against the rest of the body. The immune system is a very powerful weapon. And if it's not controlled you know, very carefully, it causes autoimmunity and can cause self-destruction. In fact, when you get an infection or some serious disease like sepsis, where you have bacteria in your bloodstream or LPS in your bloodstream, it's not actually the microbes that kill you. Same with COVID. It's not the virus that kills you. Um, the virus, you could probably ignore it without it causing much damage. It's actually your own immune response to it. The immune overreaction that releases all these cytokines uh, and the T cells start damaging your own tissue. So um, so anyway, we know it's very powerful. Um, and and so we, we came across in the literature a bunch of different methods that we thought to combine. Um, uh, so at Immune Age, we basically have a two-part platform. The first part is called stem supply, and it's research that comes out of Stanford and Oxford. And it basically allows for the first time a thousandfold expansion, amplification of your supply of human hematopoietic stem cells, HSCs. Um, prior efforts got about tenfold expansion before losing stemness. And so now we can get our hands on an arbitrarily large supply of aged human HSCs. Um, and that alone would be a huge breakthrough, will be a huge breakthrough for the bone marrow transplant field and opens new vistas for what we can do with bone marrow transplants. In fact, we may even be able to do non-myeloablative, non-toxic, non-conditioned bone marrow transplant where you just infuse in extra HSCs. Um, but for us at Immune Age, it allows us to do high throughput screening, combinatorial screening, um, in aged human HSCs and other immune cell types for the first time at scale. And so we can combine that with advanced technologies, AI, ML um, methods. Uh, and, and so we have already, with a collaborator in Switzerland, found a molecule that rejuvenates HSCs and T cells and general immune function better than anything that our team of immunologists has ever seen. We have some of the world-leading immunologists of aging uh, on board already. Um, and so that was a really good proof of principle that this approach will work. And so now we're scaling up that platform. We're looking at mitochondrial function, mitophagy, mitochondrial membrane potential, mitochondrial mass. Uh, we're looking at stemness and polarity of stem cell division. We are looking at um, functional readouts like colony formation and myeloid lymphoid skewing. 
Um, and we're also looking at epigenetic aging, like Horvath style methylation clocks and transient ex vivo reprogramming. So, um, so yeah, that's sort of in a nutshell, what we're up to. Uh, we just closed our pre-seed round that was oversubscribed. We've got a, uh, fund backed by Peter Thiel as an investor. We've got the former CEO of Novartis as an investor, an SAB member, um, the CSO, former CSO of Fresenius Group, one of the biggest biotech pharma um, companies in Germany. So anyway, we've got really good, uh, we've got Balaji Srinivasan uh, from Entries and Horowitz. We've got really good people on board already in the pre-seed round, which is really nice to see. And so, yeah, hopefully onward and upward, and we're going to be raising our seed round uh, momentarily. <laughs> This is fantastic. And um, in terms of personal, uh, I mean, commitment and management, how do you uh, deal all of these tasks between being the founder, say, of Immunage Pharma and being the, the co founder and general partner at Health Spend Capital? Uh, and you're still a CEO at uh, Sam Samsara or you're, you, you don't work anywhere uh, you don't, uh, anymore? No, I'm an advisor to Samsara and just a friend of the team. Um, yeah, so most of my time and energy at present goes to Immune Age. Mm -hmm. um, the health spend capital side is relatively straightforward because there are a limited number of long bio companies in existence. Uh, we know what most of them are. My colleague, Nathan Chang, who runs the Long Bio Fellowship, which everybody interested in longevity, I'll give a plug, should go and search Longevity Biotech Fellowship, LBF, and it's run by my colleague, Nathan Chang, and two other colleagues. And it is the premier program for anyone interested in longevity biotech. So they have world-class speakers. They have great networking. Uh, they have in-person events. It's a great way to transition into the long bio field if you're new um, and get an overview of, of the space. So everyone should check out the long bio fellowship. So through that, we know a lot of people in the field. And Nathan also runs the media empire associated with longevitylist.com. So on longevitylist.com, you can find most of the long bio companies, clinical trials, investors, job postings, et cetera. So it's really your one-stop shop for everything long bio. And, uh, and he's a force of nature, the invincible Nathan Chang. So shout out to him. Um, so, so the health span side, uh, it, it doesn't take that much of our time. There are a limited number of companies in the space, and we already kind of know all of them. We know where the where the skeletons are, are in the closet, where the bodies are buried, so to speak. So we know what to look for. And so uh, that's relatively straightforward for us. So just to talk about a little, a little bit about uh, health span capital. Uh, if you can summarize us uh, the investment thesis. So we know you invest in a longevity biotech startup, but uh, at which step do you intervene from uh, the IP or from the C stage or phase one ready uh, and how much do you put uh, on the table? Uh, do you invest alone or you, you, you like to have other VC with you? Uh, are you the first yeah. check? Yeah, yeah, we like to be the first check. Um, mm -hmm. So we, you know, myself having been company founder knows that the first money in is usually the hardest to raise. Um, and so we like to really enable things to happen that wouldn't otherwise occur. Uh, if not for our efforts, or at least expedite them dramatically, right? So it's like the the great man theory of history versus the evolutionary theory of history. Um, will these things happen inevitably uh, as technological progress marches on, or can we catalyze them and expedite them at, at all? Um, so like, where would we be without Elon Musk developing, you know, popularizing electric cars? Probably would have come about, but maybe it would have taken another 10 or 20 years or something like that. So anyway, um, so we like early stage, but we're pretty flexible. We can invest across multiple stages. Um, as far as at the IP stage, um, we actually work closely with an organization called VitaDAO, which everyone should check out as well. Get involved with VitaDAO, V-I-T-A-D-A-O. And VitaDAO is uh, investing earlier than us and in the Valley of Death. We co-invest with them a little later. But basically, um, one of the main problems in biomedicine is that there's so much intellectual property, so many good ideas sitting on the shelf in academia all over the world. And most of these universities are under ventured. So they're not covered by, you know, venture funds or pharmas, et cetera. Uh, outside of places like Boston, San Francisco, San Diego, most places are, are relatively neglected. And so it's quite difficult for an academic to spin out a company or to license an asset. And the tech transfer offices, generally speaking, are not well incentivized to help with that. So 
Um, this is sometimes called the valley of death, where you go from academic discovery, you know, something like CRISPR that can revolutionize uh, biomedical research. I think CRISPR, to be fair, is a little overrated at this point, and there are other versions of CRISPR that are better. Um, but, you know, it's the kind of thing where you can have some amazing technology just sitting on the shelf, and most of them wither on the vine, because one of the really problematic aspects of the intellectual property regime globally is an academic will file a patent it will go stale if it's not licensed quickly and then you know it'll be too old to be attractive to any licensor uh and so licensee and so um it withers on the vine and so in essence if a patent is not licensed within two or three years uh it's very unlikely ever to be licensed and then because it's been filed and that information is in the public domain, it's prior art, it means no one in any time in the future can ever develop that technology because it's not novel. And that would be fine in a company like engineering automobiles where you can just use that idea in your engine and it's fine. But in uh, pharmaceutical development, you need to run large clinical trials. You have to put in tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars of clinical trials. And you're not going to do that unless you have very strong patent position, IP position. Uh, and so it actually precludes and prevents anyone from pursuing these ideas. So you're taking a torch to the corpus of innovation. You're just lighting a blaze, all of this innovation uh, for nobody to pursue it in the future. So it's it's a really perverse situation. And there's a book by Federal Reserve economists, Boldrin and Levine are their names. And they it's called Against Intellectual Monopoly. And they argue that patent system is actually is holding back innovation more than it's incentivizing it. And I've seen that firsthand. I mean, you have big companies that can pay lawyers a lot and they crush competition, they crush innovation. Um, so so yeah, that's that's an issue. So how do we solve that? Um, enter Vita Dow, enter the decentralized science movement. So this is a very new movement. It's two or three years old in its modern form. And basically, um, it involves, oh, sorry, I'm frozen for a sec. Uh, it involves um, taking capital from the general population or sophisticated investors via Web3 and the crypto rails to make it easy for anyone anywhere in the world to pool capital towards certain purposes. And then you finance biomedical research and spin out companies and you focus at the valley of death because that's really where the bottleneck is. Mm -hmm. So with the Web3 movement, um, there's a new type of corporate structure uh, called the DAO, the Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And um, you know just how 200 years ago or whenever uh, the, the, the limited liability corporation revolutionized the way we operate and do business in the world, um, the DAO can potentially do the same thing mm -hmm. in that you basically take the C Corp type structure, its governance and voting, and you put it on the blockchain for everyone to see. And anyone can participate, can invest globally. Uh, you get rid of a lot of the arbitrary restrictions that exist uh, related to, say, Delaware C Corps. Anyway, so with that, Vita DAO is just one example, and we have uh, fundraised, you know, over ten million in the last ten years or in the last two years. Uh, we have backing by Pfizer Ventures and Balaji Srinivasan and, and many, you know, big names to um, invest in companies and academic projects that target the hallmarks of aging, the biology of aging, neglected areas that fall outside of the normal pharmaceutical dogma. So like to give you an example why dogmas matter so much, this is how science works, this is the structure of scientific revolutions. You have the rise and fall of ideas and it's always a battle for these ideas. Uh, it's not like scientists are these dispassionate, you know, uh, observers. They are, they have dogs in that race. They are um, propounding, putting forward, proselytizing for a certain view. And so one dogma that has been quite destructive is uh, the amyloid hypothesis as to what causes Alzheimer's disease. Uh, for about 20, 30 years, the dogma was that there's this one protein called amyloid beta, which causes Alzheimer's disease. And if you could only target that protein, it would work for Alzheimer's. 
Uh, it turns out that amyloid beta is very important in a very small subset of Alzheimer's patients, the genetically heritable version. It's about 1% of the Alzheimer's population. Everybody else, it's not the primary causal factor. It's probably a later downstream consequence of something else. And so billions of dollars have been wasted over the decades by big pharma and by academia targeting this amyloid beta. Um, and it turns out that academia and pharma kind of ignored and swept under the rug evidence contravening the amyloid hypothesis. And there was even a really good article expose about this in Stat News, S-T-A-T News, uh, about an Alzheimer's cabal of leading academics who actively suppressed alternatives to the amyloid hypothesis. And when they did that, I don't know how many millions, tens of millions more people had to suffer for longer with Alzheimer's without a treatment. And the economy took a major hit because it's a huge, you know, expenditure taking care of patients with Alzheimer's dementia. Anyway, so, you know, it's like how Max Planck, the physicist said, science progresses one funeral at a time. You have to allow the old stale ideas to be cleared out to make room for the new. And so this is what uh, Vita Dow and related organizations like Molecule are aiming to do with the DSI space. They're also aiming to uh, bring in new types of publishing because the journal system is actually pretty inefficient as well. So, um, you know, that's topic for another time. I can get into that in more detail if you're curious. Fantastic. Uh, what what you, what you said about uh, you know the the, um, the amyloid plaque uh, in Alzheimer it reminds me also uh, how can I say you know the the, Pru the prisoner's theory of prion on on Crossfield Jacobs uh, disease uh, you know he he was such a powerful scientist that he forbid nearly all maverick scientists to develop other theory about the disease and you are you are right we we, we need first of all um this this new era of funding and publishing is fantastic because it, it not only allows um great science you know mainstream science to, to go faster but also to it give chance to maverick scientists to to do something out of the box you know and this is fantastic and so you are advisors to molecules also maybe you would like to say some words or yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point. I didn't know Stanley Prusner did all of that uh, with the prion <laughs> yes, theory, but that's very interesting. Yeah, he won a Nobel Prize, and then he had the clout to like suppress alternative theories. I, I don't know as much about that, but yes. Um, so, um, you know, if you think about it, most people in the Western world do not think that it's a good idea to give small committees of people within the state, within the government, immense power over society. Um, we saw in the Soviet Union or Soviet China or modern day China that that can go terribly wrong. Uh, we believe, you know, sort of in the in the spirit of Friedrich Hayek, uh, the the um, Austrian economist, uh, that we want markets and individuals to make these decisions. And that way, you know, you have information sort of trickle up in this decentralized way and it tends to be more accurate. Um, you know, price discovery for things, right? The way we determine the price for oil or for gold or for rice uh, or for stocks is not central committee dictates. We do not ask the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee what the price of rice should be. Mm -hmm. They maybe try to influence the price of gold or oil and these other things that read out on monetary policy. But uh, we, we generally speaking, don't think it's a good idea to have a small committee of bureaucrats um, dictating thing, important things about the economy, um, setting aside the fact that central banks control the most important price in the economy, which is the interest rate, which is the price of money, um, which can be set by free markets, by the way, it has been done. Um, so just the same, we don't think it's a good idea uh, for a small committee of scientists at the NIH or at top academic institutions to say what science should get funded with our tax money. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and the other thing is uh, big corporations like pharma, big pharma, they don't really spend much money on science. Mm -hmm. They portray themselves as, you know, having a bunch of scientists with lab coats, you know, uh, tinkering away with, Beakers, but actually no. Um, it's 
you know, less than 5% of all R&D spend goes to preclinical research. They mostly don't do science. You know, there was an era in which big corporations like AT&T at Bell Labs did really incredible science, applied science engineering. Um, but that doesn't really happen in big pharma. Big pharma does clinical trials primarily, and they do marketing and sales and regulatory, and they're quite good at those things. Some would say too good at those things, um, but they don't do science um, mostly. And the R&D that they do is clinical trials, and that's only about at the highest level, 15% of revenue. So Novartis and Roche, which are the most innovative uh, by R&D spend, by quantum of R&D spend, spend about 15% of every dollar that they make on R&D, and that's mostly late stage clinical trials. The other pharmas like Pfizer are less, like 3% or 5% or something like that. Um, so they're really not doing very much innovation at all. Where does it come from? Well, we rely on the universities to do that. The universities um, get pretty much all their money from the NIH or some government body. And these organizations, you know, you talk to any scientist and they will talk your ear off for hours complaining about the system, uh, how it's political, how it's rigged, how it's fat, driven by fashion and fad, how it's, you know, avoids really high risk, high reward, innovative moonshot type stuff that is what we really need. And all the incentives run in the direction of incrementalism. If you're doing your PhD at Oxford or Caltech or somewhere like that, you just you as an individual or a postdoc uh, don't have that much incentive to take a very high risk project. You just want to get your high impact paper done, graduate, finish your postdoc, move on to the next phase. And so careerism is actually in part really holding back uh, high impact innovation. And so part of the reason for that is it's very competitive to get NIH grants. It mostly goes to the same labs that are un, run by re relatively older PIs, well-connected politically. And so we see a huge opportunity to uh, finance those projects that are outside of the dogma and have very high moonshot potential because they're being systematically undervalued by the current system. Similarly, the thesis for any longevity long bio investor is longevity drugs are systematically undervalued by this by the market if you have a drug that extends healthy lifespan across species uh, and works on one of the hallmarks of aging and can work for many different diseases and you know it's relatively safe because if you give it to a mouse for its whole life it extends the lifespan it doesn't compromise it sort of the dirty little secret is that most drugs out there on the market if you give them to mice for their whole lives they're almost definitely going to reduce lifespan rather than extend it, right? So, because uh, most drugs, we don't do that study. We don't do lifespan studies in big pharma historically. Um, anyway, so if you have a drug that's a bona fide gero protector, extends lifespan, uh, it's generally not fully appreciated for its merits. And so if you can identify all of those in academia or in biotech companies and, and invest in those specifically, um, it's more likely to work in the clinic because... One of the reasons why big pharma has such a high failure rate, it's 90% failure rate on average from phase one to approval, 90% failure in the clinic, is because there are fundamental um, flawed assumptions, philosophical underpinnings of the way we do drug discovery traditionally is wrong. Um, and part of that is, as you can see with another podcast recently with uh, Dr. Jack Scannell, a friend of mine, who coined the term E-Rooms Law, which is the inverse of Moore's Law. So Gordon Moore uh, coined the term Moore's Law with semiconductor processing power and doubling every 16 months or so. Um, well, we have the inverse of that in pharma, big pharma, internal R&D pipelines, getting exponentially less productive, more expensive to get new drugs approved um, at a time when the FDA is getting more lenient in their approval process. So it's really quite a disaster. And part of the reason for that, Jack and I agree, we independently came to this conclusion, as of many others, is that the animal models of disease that are used by big pharma today and many biotechs are unrealistic to the human disease. So I mentioned amyloid hypothesis. They generated a genetically modified mouse that expresses 10 times the normal level of amyloid beta. And of course, that's not good for your brain. And then they call that an Alzheimer's model. And a bunch of drugs, monoclonal antibodies, for example, work very well in that model. 
but it's not realistic to the human disease. Or another example is fibrosis. You inject a mouse with this toxin called bleomycin, and it causes damage that looks like fibrosis, but it's not what's happening in the human disease. And Jack Scannell has published in Nature Biotech recently um, that as soon as you get a reliable animal model of disease, uh, you suddenly get very effective therapies for that disease. And then innovation kind of slows in that area. It's perceived as a solved problem. So it's actually the best job security that you can have as an animal model of disease is to not be very reliable. <laughs> and it sticks around for a long time because people keep banging their head against the wall, the same wall. Um, and so one example of this is um, phenotypic screening and phenotypic uh, drug discovery. So like one very simple phenotypic screen is you inject mice with uh, microbes, infectious disease microbes, and uh, then you give antibiotics. And that model turns out to be pretty reliable, uh, similar to the human disease. And, you know, they did that in uh, the 1920s and 30s in Germany, uh, maybe a little earlier. There's this good book called Demon Under the Microscope about the discovery of the sulfonilamide first class of antibiotics, later followed up by very similar methods at Oxford, by my college at Oxford, no big deal, Lincoln College that discovered penicillin. Um, Alexander Fleming founded at Queen Mary University, but he never did anything with it for like five or 10 years. And then um, Howard Florey, uh, Nobel uh, shared the Nobel Prize for actually commercializing it uh, during in time for World War II to save you know tens of millions of lives. So anyway, um, that's kind of back in the day when we did pharmaceutical drug discovery. It was phenotypic screening. It was more realistic models of disease, uh, less contrived genetic models or toxin-based models, and a lot of natural products chemistry. So most drugs have come from uh, the natural world. So plants, microbes, and then we tinker with them in the lab. Uh, it's really been a more modern phenomenon in the last so 40 or 50 years that uh, we have done fully synthetic small molecule development. And then I would say, just to conclude on this point, over the next probably 30 years, small molecules will, will start to lose favor uh, and biologics will continue to gain ground as the modality of choice. And at some point, gene and cell therapy are going to be really the only form of medicine that we use that might take 50 years or so, but maybe sooner. Um, because small molecules, the way they work, like you pop a pill of aspirin, it binds a uh, certain protein, COX-2, uh, COX enzymes that reduce inflammation. And the way it works is it makes those enzymes work less effectively. Most drugs make uh, enzymes or their targets work less effectively. Um, and that's not very good. It causes side effects, right? Like all proteins exist for some reason, right? They don't exist to make you sick. And so you can, in some rare instances, improve the symptoms of a disease or even treat a disease uh, by making a protein work less effectively. But generally speaking, it's fraught with risk and side effects. You're breaking the system in some minor way to fix some other larger breakage elsewhere in the system. That's how small molecules generally work. There are exceptions. But anyway, that uh, pales in comparison to um, rewriting the genetic code, right? Gene therapy. If we can speak the programming language of life, uh, there's really no limit to what we can achieve. The only thing that distinguishes you and I, all of us, from, say, a turtle or a shark can live 500 years or a tree that lives 5,000 years is the genetic code. So anything you can imagine, once we understand the genetic code a little better, we can tweak that. Right now, we're at a bit of an impasse in the field because the ways of delivering gene therapies, del delivering genetic material or enzymes like CRISPR uh, are held back by our uh, difficulties in the, in the delivery problem of gene therapy. We mostly use these AAV small viruses. You can't fit a lot in them. They're a little bit toxic. They're a little immunogenic, uh, and they're, they're just not ideal. They don't, and the main problem is they don't deliver new uh, material payload to enough cells in the body, right? It mostly ends up in the liver if you in, in develop, IV, inject IV. So anyway, that's a big problem. Once that is cracked, and we know some companies with some really good progress on the gene therapy delivery problem, non-viral vectors, um, that will be a revolution in medicine. And then furthermore, what may be equally or even more powerful and that, that I think will, will yield fruit in the nearer term is already yielding massive 
uh, gains is cell therapy. So you guys probably are familiar with T cell therapy. Uh, you can engineer a patient's T cells to cause them to hunt down cancer cells in the body. Um, that has revolutionized the treatment of certain very severe forms of cancer, metastatic melanoma, stuff like that, checkpoint inhibitors also in that field. Um, but there are hundreds and hundreds of clinical trials going on with other forms of cell therapy. Mesenchymal stem cell therapy, MSCs, is a very interesting one, uh, and really limited in hematopoietic stem cell therapy. But I would say HSCs are one of the most interesting stem cell types that we have. They're the most proliferative stem cell in the body. Uh, they're with us our entire lives. We rely incredibly heavy, heavily on them. Um, and unlike other stem cell therapies, so when someone gets, they stick around. So HSCs, when they're infused, they home into the bone marrow, they know where to go, and they stick around for a lifetime, potentially. Whereas these other stem cell therapies, like mesenchymal stem cell therapies, people do get acute benefit from them, like for injuries or certain diseases. But the MSCs, they don't stick around and integrate into the tissue. They're there for a couple of days. They secrete all of these beneficial factors, anti-inflammatory, pro-regenerative factors, uh, and then they disappear. So, um, so anyway, there's a huge amount of progress going on in the in the cell therapy space as well. It's mostly on the oncology side, but that's going to translate uh, over into many other fields of cell therapy in the near future. And we're hoping to sort of speed up that process as well. This is that was. Go Sorry. ahead, go ahead, please. That was one of my questions <clears throat> uh, for you. What are the two, three most promising research or discoveries for longevity? So stem mm. cells, um, gen therapy. Yeah, yeah. Those those are sort of broad modalities. Um, so yeah. those apply to long bio, but they apply to many other areas as well. Palliation of disease symptoms, as well as I mean the application. Uh, of gene therapy is most obvious and already approved in rare genetic diseases. So uh, we know the exact thing that went wrong in those diseases. We can pinpoint the genome sequence, and then we can just deliver a functional copy or we can CRISPR edit it or base edit yeah. those mutations. That is very clear cut, like that works. And pharma loves that because there are government incentives to make it really easy to get approvals there. And they can charge a huge amount of money for those therapies, which is not sustainable for the system. Because rare diseases individually, there are, I don't know, thousands and thousands of different rare diseases that we know. Um, and individually, they're rare. But yeah. together, over 20% of the population suffers from some rare disease. So if you charge a million dollars per person uh, and you have, uh, you know, what is it, 30 million people, 60 million people or whatever with in America with these rare diseases or these diseases that can be treated with gene therapies and you charge a million a piece like sure. that bankrupts the system. So um, anyway, so those modalities I like, but within the long bio field, specifically areas of biology or targets. So, you know, they're the hallmarks of aging. Um, this was this seminal paper in 2013 that defines these nine mechanisms that drive the aging process. Really four of them drive it, but the others are consequences. And then before that, um, I think it was in 2011 or 2009, Aubrey de Grey came up with what he called the seven deadly sins, strategies for engineered negligible senescence. Um, and there are just various failure modes of cell biology and physiology. And so together, I think that provides a pretty good framework for all of the different pathologies we should address. So like, what are some of these? One is uh, DNA damage uh, repair. So we know across species that animals that live longer, organisms that live longer, uh, have really good DNA repair capacity. So humans have pretty good DNA repair capacity relative to other primates. Um, whales have really good DNA repair capacity. They're very long lived. Larger animals tend to be better, but there are exceptions. And those ex exceptions kind of open uh, the vista for us for like, you know, figuring all of this out. And one of them is the naked mole rat. The naked mole rat is very small, it's rat sized, but it lives 30 years instead of three years. And generally speaking, animals live longer uh, the larger they are uh, and their metabolic rate is slower the larger they are. Um, but the naked mole rat and, and some bats, bat species are uh, like Batman, uh, they are uh, you know um, outliers. And so uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Vera Gorbanova, professor uh, in New York, uh, has shown that 
the mechanisms by which naked mole rats live 30 years, whereas normal rats live three. And um, they have very interesting extracellular matrix for one thing that prevents tumor metastasis and prevents even cardiovascular disease. But, um, but another important feature of naked mole rats is really good DNA repair capacity. And so if we could find new drugs that enhance the fidelity of DNA repair, that would be very helpful across the board. Another clue is that long-lived humans, supercentenarians, have mutations in DNA repair factors that make them work better. And the flip side, we have these diseases called progerias, which are fast aging diseases like the opposite of Benjamin Button. You get old really quickly um, in these devastating diseases, um, fortunately quite rare. Pretty much all of these different types of progeria, they're like 10 to 20 different types of progeria, um, they are mutations, loss of function mutations in DNA metabolism factors. So like for Hutchison Guilford, it's lamin A that basically twists up the DNA and, and keeps the shape of the nuclear envelope as it should be. Um, in Werner syndrome, it's this uh, DNA helicase that unwinds the DNA. Uh, in others, it's um, DNA repair factors of various sorts. So I don't know a better set of evidence <laughs> that would lead you to conclude that DNA repair is actually super important for the biology of aging, right? You've got the animal comparative longevity, you've got the human supercentenarian data, you've got the progeria loss of function data. There are some examples of enhancing DNA repair, extending lifespan in, in other species. Like if you enhance the expression of sirtuin 6 in mice, they live longer. So there's all of the evidence is available. And yet in my 10 years, in this field, there have only been like two or three companies even considering enhancing the fidelity of DNA repair. Um, and there are reasons we can get into that. It's a very complicated system. It's not clear what your clinical indications would be, your lead indications would be. Maybe you'd have to do preventative studies. There are all kinds of issues with, with that. But we should find a way because you're not going to dramatically extend human lifespan and or pr also prevent cancer um, without addressing the problem of DNA repair fidelity. So that's one that I'm really banging on about on the soapbox, trying to talk a lot about. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with the UK government's new program called ARIA, which is their version of DARPA, sort of. Uh, they're investing like 200 million a year in breakthrough projects. And uh, they seem quite keen on longevity. And so we're trying to get them to work on something that industry is not really working on much, which is DNA repair fidelity. So that's one of the hallmarks of aging. There are nine others, and there are probably a bunch more that have yet to be fully defined. Um, another one I mentioned previously is proteostasis. Uh, autophagy enhancement addresses proteostasis. There are a lot of groups working on that. I wouldn't say it's a solved problem, but there, there are plenty of people there. Mitochondrial dysfunction, that's another very popular one. Uh, accumulation of senescent cells and chronic inflammation. Uh, stem cell exhaustion. That's one that not a lot of people are working on it, interestingly. We are, um, but but we, you'd think there'd be a lot more. So there are all of these different mechanisms that that we should be pursuing, like our life lives depend on it because they actually do. Um, so like, even if you cure, even if this, why do we have to pursue aging? Why do we have to try to cure aging or at least slow the process of aging? Even if we cured cancer tomorrow, if we cured every single type of cancer, you know, uh, pancreatic or, you know, liver cancer, all, all types of cancer you can imagine, cured tomorrow. That's great for the individuals who would have gotten cancer. But on a population level, it only extends healthy lifespan about three years. Because if you don't get cancer, you're going to get something else, probably cardiovascular disease shortly thereafter. Because aging is an exponential function. Um, these different processes, they break uh, and when one of them breaks, the other processes break, right? So like if your kidneys stop working very well, it's going to cause your heart not to work very well. You're going to get hypertension and that's going to cause your brain not to work well. It turns out, despite the way that medics, despite the way doctors are trained to hyper-specialize, it turns out that all of the organs in the body are actually connected. And so therefore, <laughs> treating one organ is not really going to cut it. Um, that's what, why you get an exponential failure. Yeah. What do you think about the multi-omics approach in that way? Do you think it's interesting to 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 have like to do a DNA test, to do a microbiome test, epigenetic test, et cetera, et cetera? 
Yeah, so eventually it will make sense to diagnose and analyze absolutely every aspect of biology. At present, most of those tests are not very accurate. Uh, they're not very predictive. Um, microbiome is particularly bad because it varies so much between individuals, varies so much based on diet. Um, and the way you sample it, uh, material coming out the other end, it doesn't necessarily read out accurately on the engrafted microbes that are actually in your gut. That just tells you what is fluxing through the system, what is losing in that war of microbes in your gut. Uh, so uh, epigen epigenetics problem there is um, so that can actually be very accurate on a population level, like Steve Horvath, a friend of mine who now works at Altos Labs, this big longevity company, um, has shown that on a population level, you have several hundred people in a cohort, you can actually predict survival quite accurately uh, and, and even predict what diseases they will die from. But on an individual level, it's not that accurate. There is a two or three, if you're using white blood cells, a two or three year uh, sort of window of, of variance like 95% confidence interval. Um, and so you can't really use it like to inform health decisions on like a single year basis or anything like that. But it's very powerful for like actuaries, insurance companies, life insurance, health insurance um, could be very useful in clinical trials um, just to ass ass assay the pace of aging in a very large population. But as from what I've seen so far, these tools, these omics tools are not yet accurate enough for you to basically say, all right, this month, I'm going to change my diet or lifestyle or take a supplement or take a drug. And then, you know, six months in the future, or 12 months in the future, I'm going to have some delta that is statistically significant. It's not there yet. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever get there because the pace of aging proceeds relatively slowly. So for even if you had the most accurate statistics, most accurate tool possible, your pace of aging, um, you know, it's like a first deriv second derivative, you know, it will, it will be up and down varying like day to day. Did you sleep well last night? Okay, good. Your pace of aging is slower than normal. Um, so it's, there's so much noise in that, the pace of aging that, you know, on a multi-year basis, you can get relatively accurate, um, but not to inform health decisions in the near term. But if we don't talk about longevity, but like being in your golden age, a uh, very long time, the, the, as long as, as it's possible. You mix wearable and multiomics, and maybe you can tell you um, how shaped you are and uh, how to improve your diet to, to stay healthy, to stay just, uh, you know, to be, to have, the, to have your force. Because there is, um, there is a typing point between longevity and, uh, and be uh, with muscles and, uh, you know, uh, because if you, if you do too much exercise, we know it, it damages the longevity a little bit. So it needs to be smooth, smooth exercise or mus uh, musculation, muscu uh, you know. Workout. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So um, figuring out what is the optimal diet and lifestyle for longevity, that is an ongoing and very vicious debate. Um, I have my own views. I won't uh, bore you with those, but, um, you know, it makes sense to develop biomarkers, prognostics, predictors for the pace of aging broadly. And we already have those. Uh, we don't need any fancy omics. You know, it's stuff like how quickly can you get up out of your chair? What's your grip yeah. strength? What's your six minute walk? What's your VO2 max and exercise? What's your, what is your muscle mass? Cause you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to be a bodybuilder and, you know, like uh, destroy your joints or be a long distance runner, destroy yeah, your yeah. joints. But you do want a lot of muscle mass because we lose it, you know, like one or two percent every decade after age 30. Um, and so so anyway, there are all of these like really simple things that there is consensus on, you know, like don't eat sugar, don't eat processed foods, get enough sleep, don't be stressed out all the time, um, you know, uh, do yoga or Tai Chi or some meditation, things like this, um, you know, have a good community. Uh and, you know, all of this stuff is obvious. We don't need omics for that. Like the jury is in. We know that stuff is good for us. We just don't really dial into it. And we, you know, it's the implementation that's hard. It's not, it's not the knowledge that it would be good for us. And somebody that I really admire um, is um, uh, working on, uh, named Brian Johnson. He's working on this blueprint technology. And so uh, it, it's come out, or technique method. It's come out uh, in the news recently, but he's been doing it for years. Yeah. And he has managed to, he looks awesome, um, you know, and he slowed his pace of aging. 
But, you know, he's been measuring this for some years. So he has pretty deep data set and he's taking every supplement in the books, he's doing everything. And so like, can we get everybody to have sort of mini version of Brian Johnson's blueprint protocol? Probably yes. It's something that health insurance should reimburse for. It's something that we should have everybody building a really good foundation for. It's the kind of thing we should teach in school, right? Like kids don't need to know geometry, generally speaking. I've barely used any geometry that I learned. I like geometry actually, but I haven't really used any of it in my life. What if we just replace that with, you know, health? And I guess probably because health is too political. Um, you know, there's so many different opinions. Yeah, nutrition, but that's the thing. It's very political. The U.S. Department of Agriculture yeah. is what sets the food pyramid in the United States. U.S. Department of Agriculture is a trade organization, practically. Mm -hmm. It doesn't represent, it's not the FDA. And by the way, the FDA doesn't care that much about your health either. Um, it's the U.S. Department of Agriculture, whose job is to ensure that people elsewhere in the world and people in the United States are consuming the main agricultural exports of the United States, which are grains. Corn. <laughs> yeah, corn, uh, genetically modified corn, BT corn. toxin corn, um, genetically modified wheat, sprayed with glyphosate, um, you know, uh, soy, canola. These are all, in my view, not optimal for human health to use as the basis of your diet. I believe humans are hunter gatherers. We're probably better off eating the kind of stuff that we would have encountered pre agriculture. Um, anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. So, so yeah, I try to do stuff to be healthy, um, but nobody really knows for sure what is the optimal diet and lifestyle for longevity because it's a hard study to run. We have some indication in the animals, but yeah, the jury is still out on that. Very interesting. Um, I, I was I was about to ask also. You mentioned uh, the blueprint protocol from uh, Brian Johnson. So, what is your routine? Do you have a a secret routine that you didn't mention yet, except nutrition and exercise? Do you take some supplements or? Yeah. Um, well, I'll let you guys in a little secret since it's just us here. Um, I get young blood. Uh, yeah. from from young blood donors yeah they're in my basement they're very happy I keep them well fed and everything and they see they see sunlight at least once a month and and also human breast milk delivered every morning on Craigslist wow. it's not knew, cheap but I yeah, knew it I knew it I knew it yeah, yeah. you are eight years old uh, I am yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's like what is it that date with a vampire or something is immortal <laughs> yeah so so in actuality young blood doesn't really do that much good Uh, it's actually that there's bad stuff in the old blood. That seems to be the current consensus. Mm -hmm. So you can surgically link the circulatory systems of a young mouse and old mouse. The old mouse gets a bit younger, but the young mouse gets a lot older. And that's an indication that it's actually stuff going wrong in the old mouse, secreting these pro-inflammatory, damaging anti-regenerative factors. Um, and so that's actually helpful because we know how to neutralize circulating blood factors. We can use a monoclonal antibody for example, or scrub the blood with uh, plasmapheresis or anaphoresis. And there are actually some really compelling clinical trial data from um, Griffles, a company in Spain, showing that if you uh, basically just dilute the blood of aged patients with Alzheimer's disease and many other diseases is beneficial, um, and you replace it with saline and albumin, you basically just dilute out the blood. Um, it's like a modern day form of bloodletting. And that improves outcomes across the board. It seems to reduce inflammation. We don't really know exactly why, but Arena Convoy at Berkeley, then at Stanford, pioneered this technique in the modern era in Tom Rando's lab to do heterochronic parabiosis. You surgically link the old and young mice. And so there's a lot of interesting work coming out of that. Um, but that whole like young blood uh, rumor, it's it, it wouldn't do you much good. Uh, in fact, it'd probably do, do more harm than good. Uh, in case there was some pathogen in the young blood that was transmitted. And a young person can survive these pathogens without an issue. But when you put it into an old person, that pathogen will go from being sort of quiescent or, or not noticeable to being severe, like cytomegalovirus, for example. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so um, my own routine, you know, I try to cut sugar and simple carbohydrates, try to sleep early, easier said than done, you know, try to get regular exercise. I do yoga regularly. That helps a lot. Um, you know, that kind of simple stuff. And then I take a whole lot of supplements. I have a list document that I share with people about which supplements I take and the evidence supporting them and how they, we believe they work. 
Um, and then, you know, um, some people take rapamycin, some of the world leaders in the field take rapamycin, some take metformin. Um, I'd say, you know, it probably makes sense to wait on that a little while until we have more data, but um, for some people it makes sense. So that's the general strategy I take. Okay, great. Um, another question. So you still believe in the magic pill, La Fontaine de Jouvence? <laughs> Or, or um, do you think we will always need hygiene, like food, exercise, and sleep anyway? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, if we're talking about hundreds of years in the future, um, we may we may find thera therapies that mimic exercise or that mimic, you know, diet, ideal diet. You know, supplements can already do a lot of that. Um, I don't I don't know about that uh, or like the Soylent Green. Uh, pill, you know, like Huel, uh, Soylent that purports to have every nutrient that you need in a sim simple drink. That's actually totally insane in my view, because nutrition is a relatively new field and we're always discovering new nutrients, right? We know what are the essential vitamins and minerals and so on uh, to prevent an acute disease from occurring like scurvy or pellagra. But we don't know what nutrients are necessary for optimal health and longevity. And there's an interesting scientist called Bruce Ames, one of the greatest living biochemists at Berkeley. And he uh, invented the Ames test. It's used in all IND enabling studies for genotoxicity to see if your drug is toxic. He won the National Medal of Science. He's a, he's a very smart cookie. And he came up with this theory in recent years called the triage theory, which basically says, and Linus Pauling and, and others in orthomolecular medicine put forward similar ideas many years before, that the body will triage and use nutrients uh, for the most acute need, right? So if you take magnesium, it'll be used for muscle contraction, your heart beating, whatever. But if you have a, a more magnesium than you need at that moment, your body will use it for preservation and longevity. So it'll complex with ATP, it'll generate energy, it will be used for DNA repair enzymes, you name it, right? So nutrients are used by triage for the most um, acute urgent needs. So for those who don't know what triage is, uh, on the battlefield, if someone is, or in the hospital, if someone, there are three categories of people, people who are not that very damaged, and they will be fine no matter what you do to treat them, you can ignore them. There are people who will be, who will not survive no matter what you do, and you ignore them too. The middle ground are those people where you can actually move the needle, you can make a difference. And that's the concept of triage. And so similarly, the body will use and preserve uh, and conserve nutrients for, you know, their most acute need first, and then later for longevity and repair. So you can read that review article in PNAS journal, um, and reviewed by Cynthia Kenyon at Calico. And uh, it's a very interesting view on, on nutrition. And so my position on nutrition is we really don't know what is the optimal balance of these molecules. In any given apple, there are thousands of molecules in an apple, right, or a steak. Uh, and so we really don't know what is the individual contribution of each of those molecules to our health. And so, therefore, the best that I can think to do is um, try to eat a diet that we evolved to eat and a lifestyle that we evolved for. So I believe that most of our ailments mental and physical are caused by the degree to which we are living out of sync with what we evolved for our ancestral evolutionary pattern. Uh, and it was said, I think it was EO Wilson who said, um, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Uh, it's got huge explanatory value, although it's not complete. There are epigenetic theories that are kind of outside of evolution or outside of um, Mendelian inheritance. Um, anyway, so uh, so I just kind of advocate that we eat more of a hunter gatherer type diet. We don't eat any processed food that's new that your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food, that kind of thing. So, but there are a lot of people qualified to talk about that. So I'll leave it to them. Uh, if you allow me, maybe a question about the prediction of, uh, uh, of the health innovation, you perfectly talked about the shift, the paradigm, the paradigm shift from, uh, you know, the chemical drug developed by uh, big pharma and chemists, you know, to uh, the biological drugs and bio, bio biotherapy developed by uh, molecular and cellular biology and biotech startups. 
uh, how do you see the future of you know this industry? Do you think that uh, a big pharma will disappear and we will see the emergence of big biotech? You know who, that who that will handling all the value chain from science to the distribution. Or you think that all this model, you know, this big cooperation model are done, we are going to something new? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'd, I'd love to spend some time and think deeply on that. Um, my current view is that uh, the current system is, is broken, but it was most broken probably 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's improving a lot because of the expansion of the biotech sector. So... Um, there's some really cool uh, data from a gentleman called Andrew Lowe at MIT, and he has shown that the um, pace of new drug approvals, uh, the probability of drug approvals is increasing rapidly in the last four or five years. Uh, and he attributes that in large part to more biotechs and academic drug discovery rather than internal pharma R&D pipelines, sure. because the incentive structure in pharma is really perverse. Nobody has skin in the game. Nobody has equity in the asset that they're working on. You collect your bonus if you advance that molecule to the next phase of development, which is an insanely perverse incentive, right? You're incentivized to advance compounds that maybe don't work very well, but you turn a blind eye because you you that's how progress is measured. Um, so, so that's perverse. The big pharma, big pharma is an industry. There are really only 10 or 20 big, big pharmas. And so that's kind of a cartel. And it's not very efficient, not very innovative. They don't do their own internal R&D. And to their credit, they've recognized that. And so they're outsourcing their R&D to small biotechs. But those small biotechs are kind of disorganized. You have to keep raising money, every single new biotech. And it would be better if we had that continuity over decades that big pharmas have, where they keep... Uh, competence in house, they build up deep expertise. And we used to have that, you know, like prior to the 80s, 90s, um, you know, big pharma used to do a fair amount of internal R&D, and they had quite competent people, uh, they were doing a fair amount of science. Um, but not really anymore, because they have these, you know, management, soulless management consultants, uh, like at McKinsey, I say that as a joke, as my uh, colleague sitting just uh, in a, uh, across the way, worked at McKinsey for six years. Anyway, um, these soulless management consultants um, coming in and telling these pharma companies to stop doing R and D because that takes too long. Do you know just acquire these companies and then get really good at sales and marketing and regulatory and run the clinical trials? That's the current state of affairs. So big pharma's are becoming more and more like private equity funds attached to marketing shops with um, regulatory compliance and late stage cl clinical trials. But there's probably a better way to do that. Um, I would favor seeing the big pharmas sort of split up a little bit um, because there are, when you get to a certain scale, it becomes so bureaucratic and political, you can't get anything done. And actually they're doing this of their own accord or their shareholders telling them, telling them to do that. Like for example, at GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, one of the biggest pharmas in the UK, um, they're splitting into two groups, uh, like a consumer health group and then the pharma group. Um, and so I think hopefully we'll see more of that in big pharma because they're in a bit of a crisis, their profitability, except for some big wins here and there, like the COVID vaccine, which is the most profitable drug in history. Um, they, they're in a crisis because their, their IRR, their internal rate of return is declining below their cost of capital. So they're actually burning investors money in their internal pipeline. So they have to pay these huge premia for acquiring these companies uh, that have clinical data. So, uh, which is good for people like us building these companies, investing in these companies, but it's not good for society. We need those very excellent institutions. So like you said, will it be big biotechs? Um, we already have that to some extent. I mean, we have Genentech being the main innovation driver for Roche, um, Biogen, Celgene, but you know, even the biggest of biotechs are getting acquired by the big pharmas because it's a winner take all sort of model. It's a power law distribution. So once you have your COVID vaccine or once you have your Humira or multi-billion dollar blockbuster drug, now you have the ability to acquire all these other companies and, and scale. And then you can charge monopoly rents. You can charge these high prices. So um, so yeah, it's, it's perverse. I don't know what it will look like in 50 years, but I'm pretty sure it will look quite different from it, how it does today, in part because the technological, the, the returns to to technological prowess are increasing. So if you're a company that has really good, you know, um, 
certain set of assays, you know, target identification or maybe AI in the future. AI hasn't really panned out despite the hype for uh, drug discovery yet. Um, uh, Mark Andreessen said software is eating the world, but you know, it's not eating biotech. Uh, AI hasn't really moved the needle at all in biotech because um, the main problem is that these animal models of disease are unreliable. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, show me an AI that can solve that problem and I'll invest, but I haven't seen anything like that yet. Um, anyway, so I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's going to look pretty different. And, you know, small is beautiful. I think it was EF Schumacher who said small is beautiful. And I see it in biotech startups. Like you're very well in aligned, incentivized. Everyone's on this rowing in the same direction. It's not as political. Uh, everybody has equity skin in the game. And, you know, so I think startups are a really good way to advance these medicines, but startups also have a lot of drawbacks. And that's one reason why we created the DISCO model. We weren't the first to create it. We just called it the DISCO model. Um, but, uh, you know, because it combines some of the advantages of small biotechs uh, with operating in their own sort of autonomous way with the, you know, scale of a venture fund with diversified portfolio of assets with the in-house expertise of a big pharma. Because what happens if you have like a single novel asset company, a small biotech, one asset, also called a snack, single novel asset company, if that molecule fails, you know, do you, do you just disband the company and, you know, do something else? That's not good because there's this internal tacit knowledge. You built all these processes, all these ass assays, you have all of this stuff that was hard to accumulate, all these expertise and team members. You shouldn't just like go to the seven corners of the earth as soon as that drug fails in the clinic, right? So you want a pipeline, you want a platform, you want diversified many shots on goal. But there's an arbitrage opportunity because you have all of these great single assets sitting in the shelf in big pharma, in academia, in small biotechs. And there's no way to kind of pull them together under an umbrella and advance them. Uh, so they're undervalued. And so that's something that the DISCO model can do. It can take all of these snacks and put them together under an umbrella with really hardcore expertise at the topco level. Um, and usually a single snack doesn't occupy all the time as in these senior pharma execs anyway. So they can do three to five snacks at a time and that gives them diversification, keeps things interesting and fully occupies them. So anyway, those are some of the ways in which the, the model may change in the future. But I also think that, like I said before, small molecules, which are the bread and butter of pharma as well as biologics as well, um, they are going to recede in importance over the next few decades. And it's going to be less about chemistry and more about biology, Absolutely. which is good for me as a biologist. I don't have to spend my time thinking about chemistry as much as I do. Um, so, uh, and it'll be more powerful. I mean, if you think about a cellular therapy versus a small molecule, small molecules is tiny little thing. It interferes with a bunch of different processes in the cell, binds a bunch of different targets, makes things work less well, generally speaking, you know, it breaks the system in, in, a, in various ways. Versus a cell, which is this complex self-organizing thing that you can program to have these complex logical structures where it'll be like, okay, you are engineered as a cell to home into sites where they're producing a lot of this cytokine. Like you go and actually MSCs and HSCs are already evolved to do this. The home into sites where there's TNF alpha, where there's IL-6, these inflammatory sites, They'll come in, they'll secrete pro-regenerative factors, work some kind of magical voodoo, sometimes integrate into the tissue. So that is so much more sophisticated than a small molecule. And you can do so much more with it. You can program biology in that way. So, so I'm very optimistic about that. And pharma is not quick to change and adapt. So they will, they will lose market share to these big companies Maybe like Cambrian, you know, when we created Cambrian, we thought, how do we bootstrap the next Genentech, but for aging, for longevity? Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe they will lose market share to these companies that are have solved organizational problems in the bureaucracy, have a different philosophical approach to drug discovery broadly, um, and are targeting the root cause of aging, and also relying more on these new modalities, gene and cell therapy, for example. So those are some of my predictions for the next 20 or 30 years. Fantastic. Uh, we, we have reached the end of this fantastic interview. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Maybe to conclude, uh, what, would, what would be your, your advice for a PhD student or a postdoc or a master's degree in science who would like to follow your path and become a, a sci-tech entrepreneur? What would be a couple of 
of advice or even some some key key uh, books to read or what 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 he or she sh should do? Sure. Yeah, advice can be hard to give because one, it's individual basis. So, and I will give some advice, but I'm just caveating. Um, it matter. It's on a case by case basis for the individual, right? Um, the other thing is advice that I give today may not be relevant in five or 10 years. Um, but generally speaking, um, you should study the history of venture capital. You should study the history of drug discovery. You should have a context because many people will come into the field. They will be all caught up in the, the fashions and the trends of the day. They won't see that this time is not different, that this, this fashion has happened before um, to understand the hype cycle to know, you know, what qualifies as true innovation, what's truly different or what's been done before. So, you know, I'm modern in history, so I'm biased, but I think studying history and the context and the bird's eye view is very important. Um, but you also need to be pretty technically focused. So develop deep expertise in some area. And if you can work, if you can apply that, you know, like T cell engineering or whatever, that's kind of a crowded space, but say uh, hematopoietic stem cell biology, right? And really focus on that while having that larger context is useful. Um, if anybody uh, is planning to get in the field in the near term, you should join the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. Um, you should, uh, you can send me a message on LinkedIn and I have a Google Drive folder full of books that give the history of pharma, history of venture, uh, long bio, uh, key papers in the field, key books in the field. So that could be a resource to get started as well. I will personally ping you on LinkedIn for that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, happy to share it, yep. I have another question. Who, who would you follow in the field? Yeah, there, there are a lot of um, people, great people in the field. Um, I'm friends with a lot of the professors in the field. They tend to be very hyper-focused and, and narrowly specialized. Um, and so uh, I, I'm not going to say any specific people because I don't want to leave anyone out. Um, but I would recommend... Um, checking out on HealthSpan Capital, you can see some of our advisors uh, there. Uh, and, you know, there are organizations like American Federation for Research on Aging uh, that have some, some leading figures. And then there are a bunch of conferences as well. Um, ARDD in Copenhagen every year is a good one. Uh, but if you go on Longevity List or you go on uh, agingbiotech.info from my colleague Carl Flager, he's got a list of all the conferences that are going on. So you can just dive in uh, and, and meet some of the leaders in the field there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. It was fantastic to have you today. Thank you so much. Yeah, likewise.